All right, everything working on your side, Lillian? Yes, everything's working. Okay, cool, thank you. All right, it's uh, six o'clock uh, on, uh, on my screen, so I will be starting. Well, thank you everyone for joining our side event to the All Atlantic 2021 conference on the challenges and opportunities in the spread of sargassum across the Atlantic Ocean. The event is hosted by Mercator Ocean International and co-organized by GeoBlue Planet, the European Commission EU for Ocean Ops FPI, the IOC Caribe of the IOC UNESCO, the Atlantic International Research Center, the Air Center, the Atlantos Program, and the UNEP Cartagena Convention. Once confined to the Sargasso Sea, sargassum is now present across the Atlantic Ocean. Sargassum inundations are marine life ecosystems and disrupt recreation and fishing, costing local communities millions of dollars. This side event addresses challenges, solutions, and opportunities behind the spread of sargassum across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, this event also includes um, the GeoBlue Planet Sargassum Information Hub and the UNEP Cartagena Convention White Paper on Sargassum. We have today no less than 15 participants from both sides of the Atlantic. Challenges will be addressed by four scientists presenting the state-of-the-art research on sargassum, its spread mechanism, our present knowledge in monitoring and forecasting, and its impact on biology and society. The second session will showcase through five presentation solutions, whether they be mitigation briefs, a space for information in collaboration, or the use of sargassum as a resource. The speakers will then be joined by six high-level panelists for a discussion to catalyze linkages, action, and coordination of stakeholders and scientists addressing the challenges and enhancing opportunities in the spread of sargassum. This discussion will be led by Dr. César Toro from the IOC Caribe of IOC UNESCO. These events will last for two hours, but timing is short, so we will not have time to take questions from the audience, but you can ask your questions in the Q&A box. If the question is aimed as a at a specific speaker, please specify. Uh, we will have time though for two short breaks in between sessions. Without further ado, we will start with the first session. We will have today Dr. Julien Joanneau from the French Institute of Research and Development who will present our monitoring and forecasting capacity followed by Dr. Brigitta von Thyssenbroek at the Université Nationale Autonoma de Mexico, who will give us a presentation on sargassum and marine life. And to finish, Dr. Shelley Ann Cox from CERMES Barbados will give us an overview of the impacts of sargassum on society. But first of all, we will have Professor Azel Oxenford from CERMES Barbados giving us some general background on sargassum. Professor Oxenford, the floor is yours. You, you are muted, Hazel. If you could just unmute yourself and, uh, and we will be. I am so sorry. No worries. That's Thank perfect. you and hello to everybody from across the Atlantic and perhaps beyond. And I'm Hazel Oxenford from the University of the West Indies uh, here at CERMES in Barbados. And I wanted to set the scene for the following talks by telling the sargassum story as it has unfolded here on the front line. Next. The story begins in 2011 with thousands of tons of sargassum seaweed suddenly showing up on our doorstep. This has a scrambling for answers and this was followed by a recognition of the significant multi-sectoral impacts. At this point, the focus was on learning to cope and sharing lessons learned. And as the story unraveled, so the science improved and there was a shift towards viewing sargassum not only as a hazard, but also as a potential opportunity. And that leads us to the present with a focus on mainstreaming. So next slide, if I can start with the initial shock, in the beginning, the lack of knowledge led to a great deal of fear and misinformation and many mistakes were made. And the lack of prior 
relevant policy meant that there was no one to take charge and there was a great deal of chaos. Lack of funding was a huge constraint for actually doing anything. And there was major uncertainty about whether Sargassum would continue and this delayed a planning response. Next slide. We went through a period of scrambling for answers. And this was in fact, there was in fact very limited information available and it was focused mainly on the biology and ecology of Sargassum, largely from the Sargassum Sea. So the key facts include that Sargassum is a non-toxic brown seaweed with gas-filled bladders that keep it afloat. The Sargassum responsible for the influxes is made up of a mix of two species and several morphotypes and they cling together. And these two species are unique in that they spend their entire life cycle floating in the open ocean. And unlike the other hundreds of Sargassum species that grow attached to the bottom, these two are only found in the Atlantic. And they grow very rapidly, which means that Sargassum is capable of doubling its biomass in less than two weeks. Next slide. They can form large floating mats or they can break up into smaller rafts, depending on the sea and the wind conditions. And they can accumulate in huge areas of the ocean where there are circulating currents. And they travel with ocean currents and the wind. And their biomass naturally varies with environmental conditions over space and time. Next slide. Virtually all of the available information at this time was that pointed to the fact that sargassum was good. In the open ocean, it increases productivity and supports ocean feed webs. It's responsible for high biodiversity in an otherwise barren ocean. Supports several endemic species found nowhere else. Provides a nursery for sea turtles. Acts as a spawning ground for commercially important species like the European and American eel, flying fish and so on. And onshore, it provides shorebirds with high quality forage nutrients for shore plants and stabilizes beach sand and dunes. Next. <laughs> One of the important early questions was where is it coming from? Of course the assumption was it was coming from the Sargasso Sea, where Sargassum has been well known to occur since the writings of Christopher Columbus back in the 1400s. However, using ocean current models to backtrack from Sargassum's stranding location and satellite imagery newly processed to visualize floating algae, it was quickly, uh, it quickly became clear that we had in fact got a new source region, and this was across the entire tropical Atlantic from Brazil to West Africa. Next. Focusing on the Caribbean, I want to give you a flavor of the, ge of the geographic spread. So starting in 2011, the first influx of Sargassum arrived in the Eastern Caribbean, affecting all of the small islands of the Lesser Antilles. Next, by 2014, after a small reprieve, these influxes had spread further and were affecting the Greater Antilles, uh, places like the Dominican Republic and Jamaica, and there were mounting challenges for fisheries and tourism. Next, by 2015, the Sargassum had reached right across the Caribbean to the coasts of South and Central America, and the well-known tourist destinations of the Mexican Caribbean, such as Cancun. And long-term environmental damage was also becoming clear as Paducah will uh, speak more about. Next, at this point, word really got out into the international press, causing huge damage to the region's tourism industry. Next. So the problem got worse. And it was now considered to be a socioeconomic disaster with disruption of livelihoods, impacts to human health, damage to property, and several countries declared a state of emergency. And Shelly Ann will speak a little more about this. Next. A reminder that this was not just a Caribbean problem, and in fact, Sargassum was affecting West Africa, all the way from Senegal in the north to Nigeria in the south. Next. At this point, there was mounting political pressure to find solutions. And there was and still is a major effort at regional collaboration and communication of new knowledge and lessons learned. And Emily Smale will speak more about this in the next session. 
but there were regional symposia, a regional network set up by UNEPS for RAC, with partnering of many regional organizations and a drive to seek funding. Next. There were a great many fact sheets produced presenting new knowledge and the first guidelines in how to cope. Next. By 2018, the sargassum had reached record levels and a science paper coined the name the Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt, indicating the presence of some 20 million metric tons of floating sargassum spread across 8,000 kilometers of the tropical Atlantic, the largest algal bloom ever witnessed. Next, this highlighted the urgency for improving the science, particularly with regard to understanding the drivers of sargassum growth and its release from the new source region and developing forecast systems to predict the arrival of sargassum in the Caribbean. And Julianne Juano will speak a little bit more about this. Next, as time progressed, there'd been a switch from viewing sargassum solely as a hazard to seeing it as a potential benefit. There was a significant focus on innovation, designing appropriate equipment to deal with cleanup and harvest, and the development of commercially viable products, especially seeking uses for large biomass. And more of this will be covered in the next session. Next. And finally, to where we find ourselves today, seeking to mainstream the governance of sargassum in this region. There are ongoing efforts to integrate with the emerging blue economies, not just mitigating the damage to key sectors, which I've shown here in red, in um, tourism, fisheries, shipping, and actually the foundation of the marine uh, environment itself, but to developing other sectors using sargassum, such as renewable energy, products, all sorts of sargassum based products, and even blue carbon, the sequestration of carbon to address climate change. So there are many examples now of national management plans being drafted and the development of regional policy, which we'll hear more about from UNEP today. So thank you very much. Okay, <clears throat> so it takes a uh, follow. So I'm going to talk about monitoring and forecasting Sargassum. Uh, so in five minutes, this is only an overview uh, of uh, what the people is doing. Next. Uh, so I would like to, to, to recall two, two main uh, points important, I think. The first is that we are facing a very large scale phenomenon at the Badin scale. Huh? And the second point that is that the Sargassum biomass um, of follow uh, large seasonal fluctuations but also uh, interannual fluctuations with a tendency to, to increase over the years. Next. So uh, in the context of uh, forecasting, and in particular uh, long-term forecasting, it's very important to, to understand uh, uh, what is going on. So uh, our current understanding now is that, um, but in terms of season seasonality, I will say that uh, it's well understood. We know that the, the large amount of sargassum reaching the Caribbean origin from the central tropical Atlantic, uh, where they, from, which they, from where they, they, are, they are transported, that the um, intertropical convergence zone play a key role in the maintenance of a pool of sargassum from one year to another one. But there are still a uh, debate on the, on the processes driving the interannual variability, uh, could be a contribution from the Amazon or the rivers. There are pros and cons. Uh, dust fertilization um, or um, upper ocean dynamics and vertical processes that would bring uh, nutrient to, to, to the mixed layer. Transport and anomalies could also play a role. Uh, next. Uh, so um, there are already forecasting initiatives uh, which are already active at short time scale. Uh, there are many uh, by uh, national agencies, uh, private companies, uh, and at the seasonal time scale, maybe the, the most serious one, serious one is the one from the NASA, which is statistically based and uh, based on the analysis of the, of the previous years. So uh, what would be missing to this uh, forecasting initiative to be all Atlantic, uh, my point of view, it's to all have a, um, right, to have a basin scale cover, uh, to, to have equal, op equal opportunity, uh, so all the southern country could, uh, could have access to this forecast. And uh, maybe it would require also a better evaluation and qualification of the different forecasting uh, uh, performance. Next. So there are many scientific challenges for to, 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 to reach uh, 
an accurate uh, forecast, long-term forecast. The first one uh, is uh, about remote sensing. So the main difficulties uh, is uh, um, clouds. Huh? Here we, we have an example of a MODIS uh, Sargassum detection from one day. It's mostly clouds. Um, other point is that Sargassum is observed only if uh, enough aggregated. Other point is that we have a, a false positive in high productive areas like plumes or pollen. So we need to reduce uncertainties. Uh, and to find also synergy between sensor and satellite sensor at different resolution in temporal and spatial. Mm -hmm. okay. Next. Um, second point is um, well, we have to, to develop some modeling of transport and phy physiology of the, of the sargassum. Uh, we have still large uncertainties on the sargassum physiology, uh, on the transport properties, on the, and on the growth and mortality um, uh, properties of uh, both uh, morphotype of um, sargassum natans and flutans. So uh, uh, we can learn uh, by doing some cultures in mesocosm uh, to better constrain growth mortality factors, to perform Lagrangian analysis to better understand transport properties. And um, we also need to, to develop some numerical methods, um, in particular, maybe assimilation of ocean color and parameter optimization. Next. Uh, third challenge, I, um, my point of view, is, uh, is to, to better monitor stranding events at the coast. And so there, are, there are many initiatives, uh, very interesting uh, and very different social monitoring network, crowdsourcing by video. But uh, we have um, this lead to an unequal monitoring of, of, the, of the areas impacted. So, so we have no global view. Uh, we have still very large uncertainties on the biomass which are involved. And uh, we have poorly know the, the ocean processes which favor the, the strandings. Next. So uh, in, in the aim of two, two projects for sea and Sahida projects, French projects, we, we aim at developing a, a mechanistic seasonal forecast, uh, which is based on, uh, on real-time sargassum observational capacity, which are already active. Um, seasonal, uh, seasonal forecast from uh, European Center and Meteo France, a transport growth model of sargassum that we already developed, and uh, we plan to, to to give a, a seasonal forecast bulletin by the end of 2021. Next. So uh, here's an example of risk forecast for year 2017. So on the left observation, on the right, uh, the simulation, which are initialized in January. And what we see is that in the middle panel, we are able to, to represent the, the increase of Sargassum in the Caribbean Sea. And uh, in the bottom panel, we are able to, to maintain a population of Sargassum uh, in the ITCZ area by the end of the year, so it can, uh, it can follow uh, for the next year. So it's very promising um, in our point of view. Next. Um, so you can find uh, more information on our project on Sargassum Dion 4 c CNRS.fr. So this is already a transatlantic cooperation with Africa and uh, Anti and France. And we have a list of references there if you are interested. Thank you for your attention. It's my turn to tell something about the pelagic sargassum and the marine life. I'm working in Mexico, in the Mexican Caribbean, and we are exposed to sargassum um, they, almost daily when it massively arrives. And next slide, please. So when we talk about sargassum and marine life, it's very uh, important to differentiate. Um, this bloom, it is a bloom between what is a golden tide when it's still in the open ocean where already uh, Professor Oxenford said it's, um, it's a good system. It offers refuge um, to a lot of organisms, et cetera. And when it's beaching and or stranding, and then when it's called a sargassum brown tide. I will be going, telling more about this. Next slide, please. First, the golden tide. Um, even if it's good, and I think we do not debate about that, and also, but the Caribbean has never been um, receiving this enormous pelagic masses. So we really don't know, but there may be possible um, consequences of this. Next slide, please. For example, um, at Barbados, they found that when there's sagasan, the dolphin fish and the flying fish decreased. And some other areas have, have mentioned it, it increased. So it's, it might even be site or area specific. And of course, the sargassum travels long ways. It comes all from Africa and, and then passes through an equatorial Atlantic and then goes into the Caribbean Sea. So it has organisms with it, which are not really known possibly to those, to the, to those systems. 
So will it lead to new introductions and may these new introductions be potential invaders? We still don't know. Another possible impact is on the surface feeders. For example, whale sharks, they eat on the surface and I've been talking to tourist operators and they have found that uh, when they're floating masses, the whale sharks, uh, of, of course, don't feed at the surface and they were a bit deeper down. Whether it's important or not, we still need to know. The other one is, of course, the blue carbon. And it sucks up a lot of CO2 than sargassum. And if that drifts to the deep ocean and it um, stays there for um, hundreds of millions of years, of course, it's, it's uh, carbon sequestration. But we really don't know where this reign of the dying sargassum in the Caribbean ends up. So uh, again, it may end up in zones which are already oxygen sort of uh, hypoxic or, or, and maybe create that zone. So we need to study this further. But anyway, um, if it stays out in the ocean, if it, had, it would be stay out in the ocean, I think the impact would be far less. But it ends on, on the shore, which is the, which is the next slide, please. Um, and then it calls what, um, what we are starting to call a sargassum brown tide to distinguish from the golden tide. A sargassum brown tide is when um, the sargassum accumulates on the shore, uh, leachies go out, um, all the nutrients go out into the sea, it turns to water brown. Um, there is, um, because of this high organic material and also being there, being put in there, there's a lot of bacteria, bacteria activity. Um, hydrogen sulfide accumulates, of course, there's anoxia and everything which is in the zone of influence dies um, because none the organisms can't live without, without oxygen. And of course, it's good. It's a really bad smell and a bad aspect of, on the beach. Uh, next slide, please. So these impacts of the sargassum brown tide are very visible and are very notorious. Uh, next one, but also um, it, it is um, notorious at the time when it's there because fish die, there's fish mortality, it interferes with touch or hatching, for example, the sea grasses die. And because of the sea grasses die, the coastal stability decreases and there's coastal erosion also because of the sargassum itself, there's coastal erosion. So it impacts the tourist beaches, but even it goes even further because all those nutrients and all those leachage, organic material, goes all throughout the system. So it, there's an overall decrease in water quality in these tropical waters, waters which are usually oligotrophic. So, and this has consequences of all their life there, for example, on the reefs. Um, we have had massive outbreaks of coral disease, um, but we really don't know whether sargassum was the cause or it aided, but there, there, there may be a, a, a link there. Also, the, the microbiota change because sargassum has a different microbiota than the, the normal seawater. It has changed trophic relationships because the sea urchins, instead of eating the algae on the reef, they start eating sargassum. And these are just some examples, but it shows that the impact of the sargassum brown tides are not just the small section of beach and the time when they were there. Uh, next slide, please. So, usually, so most people, including managers, they just think, okay, the sargassum brown tide is bad. And they think, well, um, when the sargassum brown tide is gone, the sargassum is, is taken away again by autumn storms, for example, or anything They think, okay, everything is solved, nothing happened. But it did because those impacts on the other one, which are not very clearly visible, permeate for a very long time. So it's not just only this small beach section where it accumulates, which really actually is affected by the sargassum brown tide. Next slide, please. But it is the whole zone. It is even, it goes from the land. If the sargassum is, for example, in a karstic uh, land, where a lot of Caribbean and areas have that, uh, is deposed properly, then the leaches go into the groundwater and they go back into the sea and people take the, the water. It goes throughout, for example, a reef lagoon and it even the reefs, uh, um, receives the reef. And also the golden tides, as I said, may have an effect. So the real area of impact is far greater than just this really beach section and where the water color is brown. It goes a lot further than that. And of course, the time of impact, it's not just the time that the sargassum is physically there. It, it is the time which those ecosystems, which are affected by these impacts, need to recover. And for example, the seagrass meadows, which die near shore, seagrass meadows, which die just near the shore, they need um, at least one decade to recover. So actually, so the time of impact is at least a decade. It might even be more. So uh, next slide, please. So the impacts of the sargassum brown tides on the ecosystems in the region 
are likely permanent if those sargassum brown types recur within a decade or decades. And we have seen that that's the case. So we, this really further urges the, uh, the need for proper management, the problem of recovering and of using sargassum to order to save our ecosystems and save our, our livelihoods. Thank you very much. Hi, and good afternoon to everyone. And thanks again for the opportunity to speak at the All Atlantic Sargasm Side Effect. And I'm tasked this afternoon with speaking on sargasm influx impacts on society. Now, I believe that my colleagues before me would have made or did a really good job of setting the context and introducing a bit of, of the impact. Um, this afternoon, I'm going to focus specifically on negative impacts across sectors. Next slide, please. So specifically fisheries, tourism, environment, and um, Brigitte did a, a great job of, of looking at impacts on the environment. So I wouldn't really spend much time on that. Um, but coastal living, public health, and maritime transport. Um, next slide, please. So fisheries, of course, you know, this is a very um, high cultural value industry within the Caribbean and, and even beyond that. And uh, West Africa, even there have been reports on impacts to that specific sector. First, looking at the impact as it relates to the floating sargasm and even within the near shore, um, there's clogging of fishing gear, um, navigation is um, impedes navigation. There's entanglement of propellers and rudders. There's even overheating of engines when the floating berries get into, get into the engines. And of course, hindered access to boats and jetties. So um, some types of impacts, and, and this could be at landing sites and even out to sea, we've received several reports and some documented in some resources um, that were are showcased by Hazel earlier. Next slide, please. Brigitte started to, to hint towards reduced catches. And I would show the, the graph again on the next slide um, for dolphin fish, especially and flying fish. We've also seen increased landings of juvenile dolphin fish. And also we've been seeing some responses um, in terms of management regulations and so on to, to manage um, that occurrence. And of course, in everything, everything is not negative. We've been seeing a bonus of amber fish not previously caught. Um, also reports of small lobsters and so on. Um, so some positive, some negative impacts, but for sure, major disruptions of fisheries operations. Next slide shows um, the decrease that we've seen with dolphin fish and flying fish in Barbados. And next slide, the economic implications of this, you know, dolphin fish accounts for 25% of landings where flying fish accounts for 60%. And you can see the, the ex vessel value and overall value here. So in this case, and even in Barbados, where Barbados is identified as the land of the flying fish, even cultural heritage is being threatened um, by sargasm. And, you know, there was an interesting article um, um, asking if Barbados would be considered the land of amber fish. So these threats and, and impacts are, are significant. And the next slide just shows you amber fish, uh, which is the Almaco Jack that has been coming in in large quantities. And now people have changed their pace and, and people are now requesting this species and it has become a bit high priced as well. Um, next slide, please. So impacts to fisheries, um, very brief summary, um, but I hope that you understand what have been said so far. Looking at tourism. Now, sargasm seaweed has been described, and this is by Professor Hilary Beckles, Vice Chancellor at the University of West Indies, as the greatest single threat to the Caribbean's tourism industry. You know, it, it threatens our brand. It threatens the white sandy beaches, the aquamarine waters. And, and, and knowing the contribution that the tourism industry has for the wider Caribbean, it, 
it is causing a significant impacts. We don't really have no hard data to, to well, to, to suggest the specific impacts, but there have been reports of booking cancellations. Yeah. Um, we've seen negative international press articles, people speaking about the stench, um, how bad it looks. And of course, with the cleanup costs, this estimated cost was for the Caribbean um, in 2018 alone, 120 million. And in most cases, um, the tourism sector um, is bearing the cost of cleanup because um, beaches um, that they have within within the services they provide are are in that in the in the tourist belt. Sorry. Um, so this is just a summary of of the impacts that tourism is facing, especially. Next slide, please. Um, looking at coastal living. We can see here in this picture as well in our, our Caribbean communities, how close people live um, to the shore. And in this case, quite, quite close. And, and we know that, you know, some of us who live further inland can avoid some of the poor air quality and the health impacts, the unpleasant odors. But when you live um, right on the, on the beach side, you can't avoid that. Um, your beach use, of course, is negatively impacted. And some reports have been that, you know, appliances and so on have corroded. And um, coastal living um, is quite important, especially in our small islands context. Next slide, please. And public health. So yes, carrying on from the, the slide before, we know that um, when sargassum decomposes anaerobically, um, there is the hydrogen sulfide gas and ammonia gases. And this has serious implications to human health. Um, it could be even lethal at high concentrations. And if sargassum is dumped and stored in a wet environment, it could contaminate water supply. And you see here nitrate loads and heavy metals. Um, also, there have been reports, next slide please, of symptoms such as nausea. Um, persons have reported respiratory illnesses headaches, irritations of the eyes, um, direct contact with sargasm may also cause skin rashes or irritation. You know, and these impacts are documented um, within various journal articles and even media articles as well in, in different countries in the Caribbean. So that's public health. And moving on to the next slide, where we look at uh, maritime transport, I believe, yes. Um, so it is very difficult to navigate through these thick sargasm mats. And earlier I spoke to how it was affecting fishing vessels, especially, um, but we know, you know, other um, shipping and as well as, well, we've seen some pictures earlier this year too with sailing boats and so on being stuck in large mats out to sea. And you know, it caused engine overheating and there's loss of speed and steerage from sargasm being caught in rudder and propellers. Um, so significant impacts to transport as well. Next slide. Um, so I didn't want to focus specifically this afternoon just on negative impacts. Although I have colleagues later in the second session looking at sargasm as a resource and so on, I just wanted um, to speak briefly about the fact that sargasm kissed shores, you know, is a catalyst for innovation. And just for um, short points, there has been a lot of innovation as it relates to harvesting equipment. Uh, most recently, I've seen an aqua drone um, that can be used to harvest sargasm. When we look at promoting sustainable sargasm value chains, and of course, this is as it relates to sargasm valorization and sargasm related products, you know, lots of creativity um, in that industry. And, and we see, you know, multiplicity of uses um, being produced commercially, even in, in the wider Caribbean. 
And then I think it has also spurred innovation as it really relates to institutional arrangements at the national level. We're seeing sectors that never coordinated or spoke to each other before coming together in order to solve the issues presented by these, you know, massive sargasm influxes. You know, at the regional level too, we have discussions um, across agencies. And most recently, we've started discussions on transatlantic um, coordination and collaboration. So there has been some strides. And, you know, I, I would call this innovativeness because, you know, we are working to address a solution, but we're thinking creatively and engaging persons that can really bring, um, different um, viewpoints and help to address the situation. And finally, a muse for artistic pursuits. Now we've been seeing um, not only in the arts, but we um, have been seeing, you know, sargasm music videos, and we've been seeing creative communication products. And, you know, it's really inspiring and um, artists in the region um, to produce these kind of products that we need to raise awareness as it relates to the issue and, and what solutions can be solved. So I want to really end by saying that, you know, exploring um, sargasm as an opportunity and not as a hazard could present solutions for a sustainable and equitable blue recovery to the COVID-19 crisis. And, and we hope that these positive impacts um, will continue um, to inspire us as we work towards addressing this issue in the region. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you to all the speakers. Uh, you did a great job at, you know, uh, giving your speech and uh, keeping on time. Uh, we are going to take a a really short break and we'll be back at uh, five, sorry, four, uh, 40 uh, UTC. So see you all there.
All right. Um, I hope you had enough time to get a glass of water or coffee or tea, depending on your time zone. Um, thank you all for joining for this second session of um, on uh, informed solutions to the sargassum spread. We'll be having today uh, Dr. Emily Smell from uh, Geo Blue Planet presenting us the Sargassum Information Hub. We'll have then uh, Dr. Lydia Barfleur from the Région Guadeloupe giving us insight on their local to regional solutions in place in uh, Guadeloupe. Followed by Jason Cole from the Sea Combinator presenting how Sargassum can actually be used as a resource. And then to finish, we'll have Jake Kiel from Fondation Grupo Punta Cana telling us about a mitigation solution for the tourism industry. But first of all, I would like to invite Iliana Lopez from the UNEP Cartagena Convention to take the floor and introduce us to the amazing work they have been doing, leading the white paper they are launching today with us. Iliana, the floor is yours. Thank you, Audrey. And uh, on behalf of the Cartagena Convention Secretariat, it's my pleasure to be part of uh, this dialogue. And I would like to say that this job has been done in collaboration with several partners. And I would like to take the opportunity to appreciate the contributions from Dr. Karima Deja and Shelly Ann Cox that have been closely working with the SPO protocol uh, for delivering this. Next, please. Instead of presenting an uh, exhausting discussion of each of the aspects that have been discussed before by my predecessors, uh, all the experts that have been making fantastic interventions in the first segment of this session, I am going to just talk about what is the background, what is this complex problem and overviews of potential impacts. I am not going to go with detail in because we have just 10 minutes. And uh, we are going to refer the strategy that uh, the Cartagena Convention has followed, the situation, and some gap analysis. I am, please, next. I am going to concentrate uh, basically to describe which contains the table of contents of this Sargasson White Paper that is producing support of the wider Caribbean region, contracting parties, and of course, all the partners and uh, of the region. So we are having at the beginning of the table of contents, the problem statement, the purpose, the background and impacts that have been already described, the Caribbean regional situation, the strategy and framework. We describe also the stakeholders, gap analysis, and at the end of the document that I'm going to put the link, you are going to have recommendations in terms of forecasting, harvesting, policy, and coordination. Uh, with that uh, more introduction, please next. So uh, this has been already beautifully described from my predecessors, uh, the influx of uh, large quantities of sargassum, because we at the last meeting of the Scientific and Technical Committee have agreed to call it influx of sargassum to differentiate of the normal sargassum existing of the sargassum C. Next. And uh, here uh, uh, we are going to describe that this is a complex, uh, we have uh, these estimations and these charts of uh, description of what happened over the last four years. Noting that 2018 was one of the worst years with um, 20 million metric tons, uh, equivalent to several uh, uh, fields of uh, sargassum next. So this has been already described and is also part of the report. You are going to find the description of the biophysical and the socioeconomical impacts, biophysicals in terms of coastal ecosystem management, near shore marine life, uh, socioeconomic, all the sectors have been described by Dr. Uh, Hesso and also by um, Shelly Ann. Um, then uh, in terms of the different sectors of economy, fisheries, tourism for the small island development states, maritime transport, and so on. And uh, the next slide, please. I am not going to entertain because already Shelly Ann described beautifully also uh, all the impacts on health on the different residents of the, the different islands and uh, in terms of aesthetics, uh, ships and health, the smell, and uh, so on. Next slide. So, the report also describes the influx event causes. Uh, this is spread out everywhere, elsewhere, 
And also uh, we are talking about the persistence proliferation since 2008. And, uh, and we, I would like to focus on the next slide, please. And so we see this complex uh, problem, Sargasso exists elsewhere and Sargasso C does since Christopher Columbus was referred before by one of our colleagues and is transported from original source to the new consolidated region. And also this schematic uh, set of interactions will describe to you uh, how can this be having different influences in terms of positive and negative aspects. Please, next. So the strategy framework focuses on the adaptation, mitigation, and policy development and coordination. So you will have this at the report. So in, in terms of adaptation, we have forecasting, barriers, how to collect and, and dispose, and, uh, and so on. And the mitigation, this is one of the most uh, challenging items, as has been mentioned before, because this is something that not many uh, of us has been focusing, and there is a lot of research that is needed. Next. So the complexity of uh, sargassum is that uh, we, with all good intentions, several researchers, institutions, and, and um, the private sector are working. So we have uh, initiatives in terms of forecasting 10, monitoring 10 as well, and uh, different techniques for barriers, collection and disposal. So there is a lot of work that is being undertaken next. As well as, uh, the, we are going to pass these three following slide very quickly, but just to say that uh, there has been several symposiums since 2015, 17, 18, and continue conferences, uh, workshops, memorandums of understanding, symposiums next, and next please. Uh, I don't want to entertain on this, 2018, 19, 29, and we have records of all the different events and conferences. Uh, con please next. Just for example, uh, we can evidence that last week there was the UK conference. Now we have this uh, All Atlantic 2021. And next week, the UNEP uh, Ecosystem Division and uh, the Caribbean Environment Program and Abbey Young Commission have another event next. So it seems to me like uh, oh, there is a good deal of uh, uh, investment on time and events. So the Caribbean regional situation has been already described and uh, how this is affecting uh, the, the island chain and the continental America. And this is also described by the report. Uh, next. And the different analysis of the different group of stakeholders in terms of when we are trying to build governance and collaboration, coordination. This is when we all need to get together to try to find solutions that are uh, from uh, the different points of view of the different stakeholders. And then you are going to have this stakeholder analysis also the report. Next. This continuous, so you can see we have from the agriculture, public, coastal ecosystems, marine pollution, climate change, small businesses, energy. And so we make an analysis and we provide even the links to some of the conventions of groups that are addressing these issues. Next. So the gap analysis and recommendations in terms of forecasting, that is something that has been uh, mentioned. For example, the, we are mentioning that it is important to have uh, a forecasting system that is more uh, predictable, I will say, and uh, that is uh, more standard. And then because we have the gross analysis, but specifically to the islands, it's very important to know and to have management plans in terms of the one specific country inside the country in which areas the sargassum is accumulating and who is being affected and to have management plans. And this is something that we are thinking as part of one concept paper that we are putting together next. You have two minutes. Yes, thank you. Next and next then, please. <laughs> so we are talking about harvesting and collection next. And um, so you are going to have all this information at the report. And then next, I would like to say that, uh, next please. So we are describing the value chain at, at the report next. And uh, we are talking about policy and coordination, and we are referring to the coordination mechanism uh, from the CLME project next, and the Cartagena Convention contribution in terms of cooperation, data, planning, and policy next. Um, also, 
building on capacity building and outreach. That's something that we have been working, policy guidance, uh, working group on sargassum and the active coordination with Africa. Next, to finalize, I'm going to share the knowledge uh, products and recommendations. We propose the use of sargassum influx as mentioned before, and next. And uh, this protocol should develop further cooperation and work with the CLME, next. And to finalize, I am going to talk about the communication products that we have produced over the last uh, um, biennium, uh, policy brief, uh, sector briefs uh, for different sectors, private, civil society, women and youth. And we are finalizing a unit foresight brief that is going to be launched next week. And um, next, please. Um, not to say, these are the policy makers, uh, for example, briefing that uh, we also have finalized. Uh, next, quickly, please. And the entrepreneurs and small businesses are next from civil society and i wish to finalize here um uh, next please and this is uh for youth and women and next thank you merci merci beaucoup uh, gracias thank you so much Uh, thank you, Eliana. And I am Emily Smale. I work on an international initiative called the Geo Blue Planet Initiative. And we have put together a website to try to compile a lot of this information that I'm going to give an overview of. Next slide. So as we've heard from the other speakers, there have been a lot of workshops and engagement with people in the region, the Caribbean, as well as West Africa about the need for information related to sargassum. Next slide. And related to this information, we need to find a way to bring together um, in situ data related to some of the citizen science and, and video efforts that were described, as well as information about remote sensing, forecasting, the science of sargassum, understanding growth and sources, as well as management. Next slide. In order to bring together a lot of the great work that is being done across the Atlantic on sargassum, we have worked to put together a information hub website called the Sargassum Information Hub. So the current version that we have now, I'll give some highlights on and point that we have in collaboration with IOC UNESCO in the Caribbean, as well as the Atlantis program and the Atlantic International Research Center. Next slide. So for the Sargassum Information Hub, what we currently have on there is links to some places where you can uh, download and submit data. So I have a couple citizen science apps that are currently available. One that is for NOAA Coastwatch that covers the entire Atlantic. And then there's another project by a PhD student at Florida International University that's focusing on Florida and the Caribbean. And both of these data sets are being integrated. Next slide. And we also have information related to bulletins. So there are some forecasts or, or predictions that are being produced for different regions. And we have links to some that are currently being produced as well as some of the viewers for satellite data products. Next slide. As far as linking in some of the management protocols, what we are, are currently doing is linking to the Ocean Best Practices Repository and showing which best practices have been uploaded to the repository related to um, sargassum management. There also is a lot of information related to monitoring protocols. Next slide. And so what we're going to do moving forward is we are looking to develop version two of the Sargassum Information Hub. And we're bringing in a lot of other partners, um, including many of the, the speakers that we have on the call today. And we'd like to make sure that we're cataloging activities that are being done by the various stakeholders across the Atlantic. And so to do that, we're going to see if there's a more efficient way to do an uh, directory 
we've also had interest in some countries in putting together country and regional pages. Um, so that's something that we're also going to work out. And we're also going to try to um, integrate in a more user friendly way some of the freely available monitoring products. Um, so, for example, um, NOAA. Coastwatch is looking to operationalize the delivery of some satellite products and a French company CLS is looking to release some of their products freely available, at least temporarily. Um, and so we're going to try to integrate and visualize this information as um, easily as possible. And also share a lot of the other information that's being produced from um, researchers as well as these, uh, you know, white papers and policy briefs that Ileana just touched on. Next slide. And you are welcome to go to the Sargassum Hub and check it out. And as I mentioned, we are providing updates. So if you're interested in being involved in the um, update to the Sargassum Hub, or if you have any suggestions or comments, uh, feel free to send an email to info at sargassumhub.org. Thank you, Audrey. Well, in the first place, I want to thank uh, the GeoPlanet team for inviting Guadeloupe um, to, to attend this event. Uh, um, the Guadeloupe region strategy uh, is based on two levels, uh, local level and an international one. And the local level lies in giving financial assistance uh, to local authorities and businesses. And uh, the international one is based on uh, three interconnected actions, the Caribbean Sargassum Program, the International Call for Sargassum Research Proposal, and the Sargassum Exhibition. Next slide. What can be noted from the local level is the amount of uh, financial resources provided by the Regional Council of Guadeloupe to other local authorities, which amount to 1.3 million per year since uh, 2018. And this fund assists local authority with Sargassum collection within the compulsory 48 hour deadline. It is also used to finance the necessary technical equipment for the rapid collection. And finally, it has also been used to set up an air quality measurement network. However, beyond this financial support to the Regional Council of Guadeloupe has been strongly advocating for the enactment of a national law that would give the massive saga some stranding natural disaster status. Next slide. Beyond the local response is the need to be able to act at the regional level in accordance with international guidelines has become very important for the Guadeloupe region. So to this end, the Regional Council of Guadeloupe has set up a cooperation program on Sargassum in the Caribbean region. And the aim of the project is to develop a concerted approach on the question. Next slide. SACO program has four functional modules, which are for the first one, the International Conference on Sargassum, which was held in December 2019, with a side event, which was the Sargasso Trade Fair. The aim of the conference was to take stock on Sargassum by presenting the state of the art in science national and international position. And furthermore, the conference showcased the effort being made by relevant stakeholders in terms of designing a common strategic framework. The second module is a sub-program dedicated to knowledge and information related to the phenomenon. And this module seeks to collect and centralize all scientific and technical contribution on Sargassum. And the third module is a sub-program dedicated to surveillance and prevention. This sub-program aims to set up a mutualized monitoring and warning center with two components, one dealing with remote sensing and the other one with public health. And to the end, the fourth module dealt with uh, internationalization of the action taken by Sargassum. Next slide. 
if SACOP, um, well, um, the, the, the cooperation program initiative demonstrates its willingness to pool resources, it will only have an impact if it's part of a strategic framework that could fit in three blocks of action. The first one focuses on the strong support to be given to scientific research. To this end, the support given to scientific research at an international level is an important element in order to help in designing public policies on Sagasun question. The second deal with action led at the regional level. On this point, it seems important to establish a close link between measures adopted at the regional level and decision taken at the local one. And the third one comes with action led at international level. Given all the action taken by UNEP, UNDP, UNESCO, etc., it might be interesting to establish a specific resolution dedicated to Sargassum as a fifth United Nations Environment Assembly session, keeping in mind that all this action will only be efficient if Sargassum gets an international status within abiding normative standard of actions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lydia. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you for taking the time today. I'm Jason Cole, the head of innovation for C Combinator. Uh, next slide, please. So C Combinator, we're a public benefit corporation uh, that has the mission of turning seaweed into sustainable, high value, innovative products uh, to restore ocean health. And really, our main focus is on, is on making a climate positive impact through seaweed. Um, and we are working with uh, the Sargassum primarily in Mexico and in Puerto Rico uh, as, our, as our first platform and our first way forward. Uh, next slide, please. We see seaweed as the basis of a new biocircular economy or one of the primary bases of, the, of a new biocircular economy. Uh, so we are, we're investigating a number of different areas and we're creating products from Sargassum in a number of different areas that, that help create this circular economy, either through direct recycling or through, or through composting and SAR carbon sequestration. Uh, so we've developed, we're developing a biorefinery for Sargassum as, as the, the opposite of an oil company, but we still need a, we still need a refinery. So we're creating, uh, we're, we're looking at creating uh, products for, for, for packaging that, that biodegrade completely in the ocean, that don't release microparticles uh, of plastic into the ocean. Um, and we're also looking at, at creating uh, textiles and materials uh, that will uh, help address the climate impacts of the fashion industry and as well as meet local needs uh, you know, to create materials uh, for local economies and, and for local use. We're also working then as uh, on the agricultural side to restore, uh, to, to restore soil, uh, restore soil health and improve crop yields uh, through, through fertilizers and biostimulants. And then looking at direct sequestration of carbon through, through biomass, either through, through sinking the sargassum or turning it or carbonizing it uh, and turning it into, that, into, a, into a solid carbon. Next slide, please. But of course, you can't create a, a new bioeconomy um, you know, with, with a, with, with, without actual products. So our first short-term products that, we've, that we're bringing to market this year and next from Sargassum, uh, that, you know, from Sargassum that we're, we're, we're gathering in, in Mexico, we're doing a lot of the processing in Mexico, and the, some of the processing then happens in, in Puerto Rico. Um, those products include a, a cosmetic emulsifier to replace plastics in cosmetics, um, a plant-based leather uh, that will uh, again offset plastic use and also offset uh, animal leathers, uh, and a biostimulant for, for agriculture. Uh, next slide, please. So I want to start out talking a little bit about the biostimulants. Uh, so the biostimulant is made from, from sargassum. Uh, we've uh, figured out ways to reduce the heavy metal load uh, and, and reduce the, the salts. Uh, so we're meeting EU regulation in terms of our, you know, in, in terms of those extras that, that, you, that you don't want in there. Um, but the, the liquid that, that, we, that, we, that we get um, is we're getting really good results in the field uh, in, a number of, in a number of different areas. And we're getting seeing yield increases of between 4 and 30 percent, depending on the crop type and the application rate which you know, for, for a seaweed biostimulant, we're, we're really, really happy with those results. And we're working on getting to, getting to market uh, first actually in Mexico, 
Uh, so you know, keeping keeping the production local, helping the local economies, helping local farmers in Mexico, uh, and then looking at export into uh, you know export to the U.S., export to and, and export to, to Europe, uh, you know, to to assist farmers in those areas as well. Um, uh, next slide, please. So then we've we've taken this we take the sargasso a step further uh, after producing the biostimulant. Uh, so we've we've done some extractions uh, from the sargassum and we've developed a, a, an emulsifier which holds you know holds water holds oil uh, in, in cosmetics um, and we think that this can actually be a replacement for a lot of the plastic application a lot of the plastic ingredients in cosmetics. Uh, so really simplifying, really kind of simplifying the ingredient list, uh, on enabling, you know, enabling short, shorter ingredient lists that don't have the petrochemical additives um, and, uh, you know, can and can really create natural beauty products. Um, and we've we've got pretty high oil oil loading up to 40 percent in, in, in a wide range of in a wide 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 pH ranges. And so we're we're really excited about this opportunity to start start creating creating um, products you know that that are natural from sargassum and show sort of the the range of applications that we can that we can utilize in uh, that we can utilize the sargassum for uh, next slide please when and, and then we took it a step further because we we really can't help ourselves um, so we took it a step further and we created a a plant-based leather and so this is a synthetic leather uh, that's uh, you know, developed via green chemistry it's completely vegan, um, or we can, or we can make it, um, or we can make it less vegan and, and have less of other additives. Um, and then, uh, you know, so we're we're targeting this at like handbags and shoes and other and other apparel. Um, and one of the interesting things about this is that because this is coming from the sargassum extracts and we're blending this, we can actually mold this uh, and create the shapes that the manufacturers want when they want them. Uh, and so we can minimize the manufacturing waste uh, and reduce the manufacturing and assembly resources. Uh, and we'll be able to do this uh, in our in our production facility in Puerto Rico uh, and bring this to market in, in, in 2023. But we're really excited about this and just to show sort of the range of products and the range of things that we can develop with Sargassum when when we bring when we bring the right people, you know, we bring a lot of different minds together to, to work through these problems. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so we've we've also created um, a plant-based rubber. This is a little bit further out um, on on some of these. Um, so we are, uh, you know, we have uh, we, we've actually created we've taken taken this a step further to create uh, aerogels. Um, we've gotten uh, some padding and some foam uh, that that has some really interesting properties. Uh, but those are a little bit further out. Uh, still need some more R and D. But uh, but just to give you an idea of the range of materials. Next slide, please. Um, and then we're, that our, our R and D roadmap includes a, whole, a wide range of additional materials uh, that that we're looking at, additional applications from from pharmaceuticals, cosmeceuticals, um, bio, biomedical applications, um, and uh, and coatings, and, and a range of other materials um, that we think we you know, we think we can make impact at scale for local communities. Next slide, please. So our, our, our approach to this biorefinery, right, is to really utilize the sargassum, take what we find with the sargassum, not try to make it fit into an existing mold, but use the sargassum as the sargassum wants, as the sargassum suggests it should be used, right? And so we're looking to restore natural carbon sinks, both in soils and potentially in the ocean, you know, through regenerating soil health and in regenerative agriculture. We are looking at, at creating bioenergy and, and, and looking at carbon capture and storage through BioCCUS. And we're really trying to get we would offer a pathway away from oil, away from toxic raw materials, uh, and create a system of a local community system for jobs uh, in Mexico and the Caribbean island and coastal communities that are most impacted uh, by the sargasso. We believe that we should be creating both both jobs and products that are useful in the local in the local environment from from from, from sargasso. So thank you very much for your time. Um, and if you want to learn more, uh, you can contact us at C Combinator. Thank you. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Jake Keel. Uh, I work at Grupo Punta Cana in the Dominican Republic. Uh, and I just want to uh, wish Jason all the luck and everything he's working on because we really need it. <laughs> we need some solutions uh, of what to do with these 
uh, large influxes of sargassum that are occurring throughout the Caribbean. Uh, and at the moment, I would say we are uh, pretty under equipped uh, to handle this problem in general. So what I'm gonna share is some of our experience in the Dominican Republic and the Eastern part of the DR, uh, how we've handled uh, sargassum influxes, what we've done from the perspective of uh, the tourism industry uh, and specifically uh, our tourism resort uh, in Grupo Punta Cana. Uh, and I think the first thing that's really important to mention is that uh, our product, uh, our primary product is what you see on the screen here. It's the beach, it's the color of the water, uh, it's the palm trees, it's the sunset, it's um, being able to wade out into the water and have your feet in white sandy beaches. That is what attracts 4 million people a year in normal times to the Dominican Republic, to the Eastern part of the island, to Punta Cana. That is why people book their vacation. That's what they're coming to see. Uh, and if they don't have that, they will look for somewhere else to go uh, and they will likely find it uh, somewhere else. So from us, for the perspective of the tourism industry in the Caribbean, uh, the Sargassum influx is really a major challenge to our business. It's a major challenge to our survival and for many of us, our livelihoods. Um, in our area, tourism is the primary economy uh, in the country. It is the primary driver of the economy. So when we have a, a natural disaster, as I like to refer to it, uh, if Sargassum influxes, that is a huge challenge for us. So if we could go to the next slide, I'll take you through our strategy basically has three parts. Um, and while I'm uh, very appreciative of all the efforts and all of the science and all of the learning that has taken place uh, in all these different presentations, and there's some, been some tremendous advances, um, really there's somewhat of a divorce between practitioners on the ground that are having to deal with uh, the sargassum influxes and how it impacts their businesses or their coastlines or their communities and how it's being looked at from more of an academic or scientific perspective. Uh, even from a policy perspective, there's somewhat a divorce between the way we're managing sargassum uh, and uh, the way that uh, all people on the ground are confronting it. So what we've looked at um, in uh, Punta Cana is really a three-part strategy the way that we've confronted this that's worked for us to a certain degree uh, and we've continued to evolve and continue to use trial and error to improve their systems um, but really uh, it's been the only thing that's allowed tourism industry to survive in our part of the country for the last 10 years um, so as you see in this photo we have massive quantities of sargassum i don't have to tell you everyone has already shown you the horrifying photos of what sargassum looks like um, but in our case we decided to take the fight to the water uh, and we decided that uh, if we could keep the sargassum from getting to the shore, then we had a much better chance of saving our industry. And then we could figure out uh, other ways to deal with the sargassum in the water because we would at least have the guest experience uh, saved and we would be able to continue our business operations. So if you go to the next slide uh, in Punta Cana, we created, uh, we tried and tested numerous types of floating barriers uh, we looked at commercial versions, we looked at versions that were used for oil booms, uh, we looked at all kinds of models that were brought to us that tested and tried. What has worked the best for us in certain conditions was a type of barrier that we created ourselves uh, in-house. It's made out of local materials, PVC piping. Um, it requires considerable maintenance, but as you can see, it is highly effective in trapping sargassum. Uh, and as you see, uh, at certain times when we have less uh, movement of water, we have less current, we have less um, sea, high seas, uh, we definitely have sargassum getting trapped uh, and, and I'll approach how we've been dealing with that a little bit farther along. So intercepting the sargassum before it gets close to shore is critical. The way that we have learned over time is that the farther from shore, as far as possible as we can get it better because the sargassum that builds up behind the barriers will eventually uh, be uh, picked up and carried away by the currents naturally without having to collect it uh, mechanically. Uh, keeping it farther from the shore also keeps the water quality uh, much better, uh, keeps the, the, um, the, the color of the sargassum from uh, contaminating the color of the ocean, which is, this is a highly relevant question for us in tourism. Um, and uh, it gives us at least a fighting chance of having clean beaches. So we could go to the next slide. 
Um, so as you see, the barriers that we use on the south part of our property have been much more effective in areas where there is not a lot of, uh, of waves and, uh, and ocean energy, where there's less currents. Um, and farther north to our property, we have employed a commercial brand of floating barriers that are much more flexible, much easier uh, to deploy and, and, un, uh, and take down when we have storm events. Um, as you can see, they're also highly effective. Uh, both of these systems require heavy management, require a lot of maintenance, changing of pieces, uh, supervision, um, and also the design is set up as much as possible to be in areas where we have uh, no coral reefs, where we have sandy bottoms, have areas uh, where you know we don't have the netting that's on the bottom of these go farther than usually uh, one meter below the water so that other species can, cr can cross underneath them. Uh, we haven't seen huge impacts on, for example, turtle populations. Um, and usually uh, the accumulation of sargassum behind the barriers is uh, generally pretty uh, temporary. But uh, again, this is something we're dealing with. We would rather take this fight into the water than have to deal with this on the beach where we would not have business and we would also have this problem and more likely have the problem with uh, decomposing sargassum, creating all kinds of uh, smell and, and other issues as well. Uh, we can continue the next. Um, one component of our strategy uh, besides intercepting in the water uh, has been how do we maintain these barriers because you have uh, equipment that's in the ocean uh, it's uh, subject to weather conditions it is subject to uh, the sunlight it's subject to uh, vandalism it's subject to any number of impacts uh, so our first uh, realization was that we needed to have teams uh, managing the barriers and doing maintenance and supervising them, correcting areas when they were overpowered by the seaweed or there was vandalism or any other issues. And we found that one of the best ways to do that was to hire local folks, uh, and in this case, uh, fishermen and their families. We have now worked with Arsemar, which is a, um, the Association of Marine Services uh, that's all composed almost entirely of former fishermen or current fishermen that are dedicating part of their uh, productive season to sargassum management. Um, these are not small contracts. These are significant amounts of money being paid directly to the local community to maintain these barriers. And then we've also looked at strategies for collecting the material when it's um, not possible simply to maintain the barriers and have it uh, be uh, uh, carried away naturally. Um, so this is a device that was created by a company uh, that's based in the Dominican Republic, it's now operating the DR, and I think in Mexico as well. And they are still very much experimental, uh, trying to manu manually, uh, mechanically uh, collect sargassum in the ocean with the idea of then transforming it into some of the products uh, and, and different um, uh, services that Jason mentioned. Um, but really, from the perspective of tourism, our interest in sargassum is basically as far as it gets to the beach. If we can protect the beach, if we can protect these barriers, we're pretty happy to leave it at that. Um, but we have also recognized that you have huge volumes of this material. At times when you're collecting it, uh, you should try and take advantage of it. We obviously don't want it to be depositing uh, this sargassum into landfills or paying uh, exorbitant fees to transport it anywhere. So we have dedicated part of our property to uh, different experimental projects, including uh, composting at a large scale using windrows. Uh, we've also done uh, experiments with a local university in biogas production. Uh, and more recently, we've been looking at other smaller scale projects. Um, I think the lesson that we've learned is that our goal is to maintain and protect the tourism industry. Uh, all of the beautiful ideas that come to us of transforming Sargassum, and of course that's the first thing people want to approach you with are what you can turn it into without necessarily getting to the question of how do you keep it from getting to the beach? If you're gonna collect it and transform it into something, how much does that cost? Is it even remotely economically viable? And where do you do this? Because you know you, you really, it's not a good use of your land to use your coastal area to set up a factory for transformation of Sargassum when you can sell it as hotel property or real estate. So there's a lot of logistical uh, economic questions that come into the transformation of Sargassum. Uh, and then we're very hopeful that groups like Jason's and, and the dozens of others that approach us uh, have some success coming up with that business model and that formula. But from our point of view, really, uh, the primary goal is business continuity, being able to offer the extraordinary experiences in the Caribbean that people are accustomed to, managing the Sargassum problem, 
realizing that it is a, uh, a challenge that is going to be with us for, for the foreseeable future. We've already been dealing with Sargassum for 10 years. Uh, and we don't see any let up. In fact, this year is maybe perhaps the most worst, the most sargassum we've seen recently uh, in the Dominican Republic. Um, and one other thing, I just before I close, I wanted to mention, um, while we appreciate very much uh, all of the forecasting and the investment in forecasting that's happened, uh, and we think that's a, a, a noble effort um, from a management and practitioner perspective, it really at this point uh, doesn't change anything that I'm doing to know that we are going to receive massive quantities of sargassum or not. Our barriers stay in the water generally throughout the year. Uh, our collection systems operate when necessary. Uh, there are such localized pressures on sargassum that we are seeing certain areas are affected where neighboring properties aren't affected at all. So some of these global uh, monitoring uh, systems are fantastic but not terribly useful at the scale that we're seeing them now. So hopefully that's something that can be taken into consideration as we go forward. And thank you thank so you. much for the opportunity. Thank you, Jake. I think the, the, the point you, you've raised is really important that you know, we need to deliver the science that the people, um, the local people need and your feedback is really, really important for us. So we're gonna move on to uh, the next uh, session. Uh, I, I, I didn't want to interrupt the, the, the two last speakers um, because it was really interesting and I, I thought they, they deserved a little, a little extra time. Anyway, so the short break will turn into a no break. Um, and uh, we will go now to our uh, panel discussion. So if the panelists could uh, turn on the cameras, that would be really good. And uh, the um, panel, so the panel will uh, be um, sorry, moderated by Dr. Cesar Toro from the uh, IOC Caribe of the IOC UNESCO. Uh, this uh, panel um, first, uh, tries to foster connection, action, and cooperation between scientists and stakeholders. So hopefully we'll, we'll be able to answer some of uh, Kiel's, uh, sorry, not Kiel's, Jake's um, comments. Um, Cesar, uh, the floor is yours, uh, if, if you would like to uh, introduce the, the different um, panelists. Thank you, thank you very much, Audrey. I have my mic mute. Now, <laughs> I would like to thank uh, uh, all of you and also my, the previous speakers who set the stage for our uh, final panel here. We will have a very uh, I, uh, I, uh, the president, uh, the way how uh, the president and speaker have been talking and managing the time is a pressure for us to keep doing the same. Thank you. Thank you for that. I would like to introduce to, uh, our panelists today. We have uh, uh, Mr. Mika Aldido, my fellow from IOC Africa of IOC UNESCO, and uh, Dr. Sherry uh, Ann Cox, who has already been introduced from Ceremonies Barbados. Mrs. Ileana Lopez, also my colleague from the UN Environment Academy Convention Secretariat. Uh, Professor Jack Sabi uh, uh, from the Abidjan Convention Secretariat uh, Unit. And uh, 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 also Dr. Kwasi Apinin Ado from the University of Ghana. Uh, Dr. Emily Smain from the GeoGrid Planet and also one of our partners. Uh, Mr. John Hanus. Policy Officer at the European Commission, and uh, also Ms. Ana Maria Nunez from the Bureau for Policy and Program Support Global Policy Network of UNDP. So without ado, please, next. Uh, it was, uh, if we look at the, uh, at the previous speaker, speaker's presentation, we, uh, we realized that uh, the issue of sargassum during the last decade, and was quite well de de described by uh, uh, Professor uh, Hazel Oxenfall, uh, is uh, have overwhelming beaches throughout the, the Atlantic. So this is an overall an Atlantic issue, and I will say it is a world, uh, worldwide issue. So if we look at our region, this is not a, a, this is not only the the wider Caribbean region that is affected is the entire Atlantic tropical region. So 
uh, and as you, you could see from the uh, also that uh, those events of large quantities of, of uh, uh, sargassum has been a spark of major discussion and uh, a, a, those who have been affecting mostly as we could see from the previous presentation was tourism and fishery sectors. And uh, a, that has a very important uh, significance in, our, in, the, in the Western Tropical Atlantic because here, most of the country, and in particular island states, they are depending on tourism heavily. In average, 37% of the GDP of countries, island states in particular, they are, there is income from tourism. That's been affected uh, heavily by a uh, uh, sargasm. And uh, also you saw during the, the uh, uh, you saw that the, during the last 10 years, there is a lot, an enormous, a large number of activities that has been, uh, ha has been uh, organized and discussion, a lot of, a, a lot of seminars, webinars, conference, a, a, and a large number of networks of experts, policymakers, and emerging managers, academia, NGOs, industry, intergovernmental organization, freelance activities, local communities, schools, and many more groups participating. So you can see there is sargassum is somehow trendy. And uh, uh, that is uh, uh, somehow good news. And uh, uh, also, as we, uh, as we speak today, you can look at and watch the news and look at and read the newspaper today, 2nd of June, and you will see that there is a lot of news about the sargassum, how it's affecting the, in particular, Quintana Roo, which is in, in the Mexican coast of the Caribbean, and other, as was just mentioned by the previous speaker, on the uh, other islands in the, in the Western Caribbean region. So sargassum is here to stay. And if you look at the, uh, uh, what is expected for this 2021, is expected to be in another major sargassum year. In fact, the month that we have just finished, uh, May, uh, the sargassum has been increasing across the central West Atlantic and set a new historical record for the month of May. Next. So, uh, what is clear? that they, we would like to sustainable management of these sargassos in fluxes that will require both local action and regional coordination and collaboration. We need to set up this and uh, uh, organize ourselves at the all Atlantic, wider Atlantic region in order to coordinate the efforts that so many efforts that have been uh, already are, are in place. So we need to have a, a coordination and collaboration be, uh, beyond areas and the national jurisdiction. And there is, of course, a critical need for comprehensive management planning in order to increase resilience. And as uh, uh, from, from the uh, policy and as well as from the science perspective, there is also a strong, inter uh, there is a need for a strong interregional cooperation between the wider Caribbean and Western Tropical Atlantic and the West Africa countries is needed. So we have the, uh, as you know, uh, the EN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development was proclaimed in 2017 by the United Nations General Assembly and it started this year in January. And one of the major issues is that uh, science should uh, go from being diagnostic, as we are doing now, to be a transformative element in order to achieve a sustainable development. So we need to hear from a science is, it should be a tool for transformation and uh, uh, achieving the sustainable development of our society. So from that perspective, we need to have a demand-driven ocean science. So with that, I, I, I would like to uh, introduce my uh, fellow colleagues in this panel and uh, open the floor for uh, 
a, a, a series of answers. And I will call, uh, first of all, so I will ask my, my, all my fellows to uh, turn off their cameras. And uh, first of all, I will uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, all of you, for uh, opening, turning on your cameras. And I, I would like to, to uh, ask uh, my, uh, my colleagues, Mika Odido and Dr. Shelley and Cox, for uh, uh, to answer the first question that we have in this panel. So what are the requests that we are receiving from your communities uh, concerning the sargassum issue? And uh, I would like uh, to uh, ask Mika to answer uh, initially this question, followed by uh, Shelly Ann. So Mika, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Caesar, for giving me the opportunity to uh, participate in uh, in this panel. Uh, the first basic request that we get from uh, many of our communities is a request for information and data. Uh, they ask, where is this coming from? Why is it coming to our costs? Uh, was the ecology was causing it? What's the consequences? How is it affecting the life in the in the oceans? How can we handle it? We also get a request on uh, uh, strengthening capacities to understand uh, the sargassum and to handle it. Uh, how can we? Where can we? be able to get the skills to understand the sargassum ecology. How can we quantify uh, the inversion? How can we model its transport and predict its arrivals? How can we access uh, uh, data and tools such as uh, satellite imagery? And uh, uh, what platforms do we need uh, to be able to access it? Uh, what impacts does it have on our shipping? fisheries and uh, tourism. And of course, uh, this being a, a transboundary phenomenon, uh, the issue of collaboration is uh, really, really key. Uh, who else is working on this topic and uh, how can we work together with them, both at the national, uh, the regional, and the transatlantic uh, level? How can we work together on uh, monitoring, and surveillance uh, for the uh, Sagasan. Uh, how can we work together to innovate on uh, usage, uh, including harvesting of the Sagasan and on uh, cleanup where it is not required? Another key area is uh, the frameworks that will uh, assist us in addressing the issue of uh, uh, Sagasan, uh, both at uh, uh, cross basin, uh, regional, and at national levels. This would include uh, the strategies, policies, and uh, management uh, plans. And of course, uh, in the many discussions that we have, uh, the issue of using the opportunity of the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development keeps coming up. If you look at uh, uh, Sagasam Science, it contributes to all the seven outcomes of the UN Decade for Ocean Science. Uh, for sustainable development. Therefore, this is really an excellent opportunity to develop a cross basin initiative for the decade on the Sagasan. So maybe this is something that we could also reflect on together. I'll uh, leave it at that point and uh, hand over to Shelly to continue with the intervention. Thank you. Thank you, Mika. Shelly? Shirian. Thanks, Cesar. And, and Mika, I think, probably captured everything <laughs> in, his, in his summary just now. I mean, what I can add as it relates to my conversations with users and in, in various sectors, they want longer lead times for the predictions. They want to be able to, you know, work on informing their decision making. Um, not only as it relates to guidance on prepositioning resources, um, but for those entrepreneurs and innovators, they want to ensure that there's a steady supply of sargasm in, in terms of, you know, um, going and, and seeking the seed funding that they would need to support um, their, their efforts. I think, too, um, 
sectors really need to know the implications of the forecast to them. Um, this is what we try to do in the sub-regional sargasm bulletin for the fisheries and tourism sector specifically. Um, but we realize that more sectors are now interested and, you know, building out and, and working on co-producing and co-delivering um, a product that is packaged where the scientific information is translated um, in ways that people can really use the information. So I think that would be an addition um, to what Mika has already presented. I think too, uh, policy makers uh, need more guidance as it relates to working on their, their management plans. And um, I believe that we are those persons working on this science policy interface. Um, we, can, we can do more to pointing people to the information resources that they need. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Shelly Ann and Mika. Uh, I will ask uh, all, all uh, uh, my fellows in the panel to keep your camera on, if you are so kind, so people can see you and follow up. Thank you. So I, I, uh, we, uh, I am calling to, to my two colleagues, Ileana Lopez and Professor Jack Cabe, s'il vous plaît. And, uh, uh, Eliana, so following with the, the, the questions that we, we are discussing in this panel, I would like you to comment on how did your organization have been answering those demands that, that follows from the previous presentation? And then uh, I will ask uh, Professor Jack Abbey, what are the key elements that you need from scientists that are essential in order to further address those stakeholders' demands? So please, Eliana. If you are so kind, the floor is yours, please uh, open your mic. And uh, once you are ready, so I will uh, kindly ask Professor Abby to follow up. Hi, Cesar. Uh, it's a pleasure meeting you uh, over the internet. Uh, the Secretariat of the Cartagena Convention has, has been working to respond to the request of contracting parties and partners to address this as of influx, um, the voting efforts to build alliances with key partners and stakeholders involved in the sargassum in the region and promoting policy and coordination aiming to enhance regional governance. So the most relevant resources are uh, the participation in several uh, international commitments for webinars of Europe we have been mentioned and conferences, but more specifically, uh, trying to every two years at least to have an updated version of the white paper with the state of the art of uh, the recently ongoing in terms of research as we you saw this morning, a uh, summary report in collaboration or with the Atomic Energy Commission is also on the development because we wish to assess the impacts of the heavy metals on sargassum as has been mentioned also for the private sector today. And uh, we have produced several summaries of the sargassum uh, white paper, uh, including the policy brief uh, for high level segments and three more following briefs, one for private sector, civil society, women and youth. And uh, on the development and launching next week, we have also a sargassum foresight brief that has, has been reviewed by several scientists. Uh, more than uh, 25 scientists have reviewed. And this is in collaboration with the ecosystems division and the science division from the United Nations Environment in collaboration also with the Abidjan Convention. And uh, we have on the development a uh, concept not uh, to fundraise and to address this gap and needs that uh, are needed regionally also to build these uh, um, synergies that we are looking for and coordination. And um, that's basically what I would like to say that we have been doing. Uh, also, we have a working group that this working group uh, in collaboration with the Sport Rack and that has been trying to bring the message of how we can come out with a regional plan. Now the discussion is, should we have like a task force working group? Uh, so this is intergovernmental and interregional. So with that, I would like to stop here, uh, Cesar. Uh, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Eliana. Uh, Professor Jacques. Uh, the floor is yours. Could you please open your mic? Yeah. 
it seems uh, Professor Jacques Abe has some uh, glitch, technical glitch. So uh, while we wait for, for him to come back, so I, I will follow with the next question and uh, I, I will kindly ask uh, Dr. Kwasi Apinenado from the University of Ghana and Dr. Emily Smail to comment on how can the scientific community provide these key elements to the stakeholders? And uh, a, 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 I, I would kindly ask uh, pro, uh, Dr. Kwasi to uh, open your mic and comment on this. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Cesar, for the opportunity to share some few thoughts on this. Um, one thing I consider as critical in communicating um, these issues to stakeholders is by developing networks. Uh, networking is, is key. You realize that um, people have information, but because they keep the information to themselves, it becomes difficult for the stakeholders to get access to this information. So once we broaden our network and then allow various stakeholders who have interest in uh, Sargassium issues to come on board, it becomes, it creates a platform for us to share um, some of the critical elements that we consider important in this discussion. Again, we also need to have community sensitization. And I see community sensitization as key because uh, people at the community level who are also considered as stakeholders play a key role because they, they, they ask a lot of questions. And one thing that they keep asking is, when should we expect the uh, next, you know, uh, um, um, beaching of Sagasio? So early warning system is something that is critical. So having this community sensitization, people get to know some of these things. And through that, we can, we can explain some of the, or bring to them some of the scientific findings, which I consider very critical. And another point that I want to uh, touch on is breaking the scientific communication to a communication or a language that the various stakeholders can understand and buy into it. Because this Sargassium thing, we need to let people appreciate that there is the need for various stakeholders to ensure ownership. And people can really participate and demonstrate ownership when they are able to communicate at a certain level. So we must unpackage the scientific communication, unpackage the scientific language, and bring it to a level where the ordinary person who has interest in Sargassium can be able to contribute to the discussion and also see him or herself as making an impact to the Sargassium discussion. So I think, I think I, will, I will stop here and allow my colleague Emily to also tap in. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kwasi. Those are all really great points. I'll say one thing related to your, your comment on language is that's something I, I didn't mention that we are looking to do some translation for the Sargassum Hub to make it more accessible to other stakeholders. And also working with some local communities to set up country and region pages so that people who are engaged specifically with their local communities can put together the information that they need. In terms of working with the scientists and the sargassum issue, there still is a lot of research that needs to be done to understand why the sargassum is proliferating and um, coming up in different areas where it, it hadn't in the past. And so that's something that the scientific community is, is very active on, as we've seen from a lot of the presentations that we've had. And also to help improve monitoring and, and forecasting for for um, not, not just mitigation purposes, but as mentioned for some of the companies who are trying to forecast if it's going to be financially sound for them to start using Sargassum as a base product, they'll need to have some idea on if this is something that's gonna continue in the future, when um, in terms of times of the year, would they need to be scheduling their collection and things of that sort. And I'll say that, um, in terms of getting the the scientific information integrated, um, we're working with various stakeholders to try to support the networking so the scientists across the Atlantic can share the information that they're doing. And it's also very important to get feedback from stakeholders on the type of information that they need. 
Um, as we've heard, depending on a stakeholder, they'll have very different information needs and priorities, um, such as if you're a local hotel, uh, you might always just keep your booms out, whereas the um, industries who are looking to collect it might be more interested in, in some of the forecasting. Um, so that's something that um, we'll be working with the scientific community on to, to try to make progress on the sargassum issue. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Kwasi and uh, Emily, for those comments. And uh, following up with uh, our a discussion and comments uh, uh, in this panel, I would like to ask uh, uh, our colleagues, uh, John Hanus and Anna Maria, to comment on what can your organization do to foster collaboration across the Atlantic to tackle the sargassum mitigation challenge? So, John? Yes, thank you very much. And uh, I would first like to thank the, the organizers for this very interesting discussion and, and the many speakers beforehand for the great presentation. I would like to underline three ways in which the European Commission um, can foster collaboration across the, the Atlantic and tackle the Sargassum Challenge through our policies, through our programs and through our partnerships. First, our policies. At the start of this, uh, this Commission's mandate, we made the European Green Deal our number one priority. Um, which is our chart towards sustainability. Yet to reach the, the objectives of the Green Deal, we can only reach them by restoring the health of our ocean and unlocking its potential for sustainable development. To address this, we have I want to highlight three particular policies um, which we have um, worked on in rec recently. The EU um, New Bio Biodiversity Strategy, which aims to expand um, the network of marine protected areas to 30% by 2030. The recently adopted Zero Pollution Action Plan, which tackles the pollution of our seas and oceans, for instance, of plastic litter, but also of nutrient loss, which of course is very important for the sargassum. And finally, um, the recently adopted um, sustainable blue economy strategy, which aims to decarbonize, um, promote circularity and zero pollution of our blue economy. Secondly, through our programs, and there I would like to highlight in particular um, the framework program for research and innovation. Um, as um, me myself, I work for the DG Research and Innovation European Commission. Um, research and innovation was flagged a few times today as a key driver um, of, of tackling or a key driver and means to tackle um, sargassum, um, we needed to, to better understand, to better observe and monitor, um, but also to valorize sargassum. And through our framework programs, uh, Horizon 2020, our last one, we've supported a lot of research in, in that direction. I want to highlight in particular the Atlantos project, um, uh, which is now a program, which Emily Smale has also referred to earlier, which has a, a specific use case on uh, mitigating the impacts on sargassum. And we've also financed, for example, um, algae projects, which um, are trying to valorize uh, the use of, of algae. Um, now, we have just put together the Horizon Europe, uh, which is our new framework program for 2021 to 27, where we have a dedicated intervention area to our oceans, uh, seas and waters, um, where we try to um, generate the knowledge and the solutions to protect um, and restore our marine ecosystems and to address pollution, including eutrophication and invasive species, um, but also to promote these, these blue bio value chains so we can use um, algae in a, uh, yeah, for us. Um, there are also other intervention areas which deal, for example, with environmental observation. So we have a better ocean observation system and with biodiversity management. Um, I would like to underline one um, initiative, this is the Horizon, um, the Future Horizon Europe mission on the ocean seas and waters, which we hope to roll out this year, which aims to protect and restore the health of our ocean and waters by 2030. Now, of course, research and innovation is only one component. Um, this is um, what I know most, but we have other policy uh, instruments like the following policy instrument or which has supported um, this event as well, or Interact project, which for example, supported the Sargassum conference um, hosted on Guadeloupe by the French prime minister in 2019. So, which are of course other programs. Finally, in a, what we can put uh, or what we're promoting are partnerships. 
the EU is committed to promoting multilateralism and this All Atlantic Ocean Research Alliance, uh, which brings us here together um, on this today, is one of the key examples, um, which is a, a really successful model of multilateral science diplomacy. Which we, we launched this in 2013. Now we have an, a community from pole to pole that we're working together. And we are committed um, to, to fostering it or to continuing this, this collaboration um, under this alliance, also under the, the future UN Ocean Decade. So we really are, um, from the Commission side, uh, committed to putting in place the appropriate policies, programs and partnerships to help mitigate the Sargassum issue. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Jörn. Uh, Anna Maria. Thank you, Cesar. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for inviting UADP to this panel. Well, for answering your question, I would like to start remembering what UNDP is doing now, and afterwards, what we are proposing to foster the collaboration across the Atlantic to tackle this sargassum mitigation challenge. Well, as, may, uh, as you all know, UNDP works closely with uh, many countries and territories around the world, providing different uh, solutions and uh, with a very huge global network. Through our uh, development settings and signature solutions, we are trying to uh, solve some problems in the countries or supporting to solve the, the problems in the countries from different angles and always uh, taking into consideration the sustainable development goals as well as the collaboration with, you, uh, with our UN sister agencies. Uh, among the main signature solutions that we have is the environment and around the environment we have been working in many different areas and supporting the development of public policy, for instance, planning processes, creating capacities, working on awareness raising actions and other uh, strategic, strategic interventions. Going, for instance, from uh, global, regional to national interventions and covering different areas as climate change, international waters, ecosystems and biodiversity, among others. Um, for a previous exercise less, like this one and a webinar for Sargassum, we prepared a kind of brief overview of the activities that we are doing as UNDP. And for instance, in, climate, in international waters, we are working uh, currently with two projects, the CLME Plus project and the IW Eco project in collaboration with UN Environment around blue economy activities and pilot interventions under the lines defined for the uh, strategic action program for the large marine ecosystem of the Caribbean and North Brazil shelf. On the other hand, we're working in ecosystems and biodiversity with projects related to management of invasive alien species and protected areas management. In energy, as some other colleagues uh, presented, uh, we are uh, using some applications um, for using sargassum as fuel for energy generation. And also in climate change, we are working a lot with the uh, climate promise supporting many countries to increase their NDC's ambitions on adaptation and mitigation. As I said, uh, based on this portfolio of actions, we have uh, identified some challenges in-house to face for working on sargassum. The first one is, it is needed to introduce this topic as priority for our portfolio projects. We also need to find consolidated partnerships and alliances to implement interventions on the ground. Also, it is primordial to introduce the topic as priority in public policy development. And it is very, very important and crucial to use and scale up research results into impact interventions and into public policy development. We have been uh, talking about this a lot with Eliana, and I think that with this series of webinars, it, it, it seems that uh, the topic is being known and is, and is being used by the different countries. And finally, it is important to create capacities at different levels to understand and be aware about the sargassum priorities, activities and discussions. From UNDP to addressing these challenges, we propose the following. Working hard in defining and strengthening synergies, support current and new projects about sargassum, to face challenges and reduce impacts, 
continue working as one UN and with other stakeholders, NGOs, CSOs, IFIs, and other stakeholders with particular focus in sargassums and towards the 2030 agenda. Finally, support capacity building, knowledge management, and awareness raising actions around sargassum. I just want to finalize uh, saying that for make the previous feasible, we think that the bridge between research and the implementation of actions through public policy planning and scale uh, intervention, intervention, sorry, is the best way to proceed. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, John and Anna Maria and all my fellows uh, colleagues who are here in the panel. I just received a message from uh, 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 Dr. Jacques Abi. Uh, he is uh, uh, he's apologizing because his uh, connection went off. So, and he's just uh, um, recommending that if uh, Dr. Kwasi Abi can uh, comment on the work that in, a, in a few words on the work that Abidjan Convention has been doing. So, uh, if you're so kind, Kwasi, if you can comment on the work of the Abidjan Convention, just to be fair to everybody that also, that is all, uh, one of the important allies and partnership in this part of the tropical Atlantic. Prof uh, Dr. Kwasi, you're you well, you mic. Yeah, thank you very much. I think I'll be very brief uh, by saying that Abidjan Convention has played a key role and continue to play a key role in the uh, Sargassium issue, uh, bringing together um, key stakeholders within the sub-region. And uh, it's been one of the things they've been pushing and really trying to bring the various governments and people you know, within the various countries uh, to look at Sargassium at a regional scale. So uh, that is one thing that I can say Abidjan Convention has been doing, uh, trying to develop a regional scale uh, not looking at it as a sectorial, you know, scale, but then bringing it up so that we look at it from that perspective and then uh, looking at a common solutions that we uh, can all be, be part of. So in brief, that is what I can say Abidjan Convention has been doing. Thank you very much. Really, really kind of you, uh, Dr. Kwasi Abin and Hado. Uh, and yes, that is uh, always a, a, a what, what is it, uh, interesting as any interesting story should have a, a, a good end. So I would like to thank all my uh, fellow colleagues during this uh, uh, session. We are coming to an end. And before we close this panel session, I would like to just to highlight two elements that uh, come out from the discussion in this panel. First of all, is that science is a key element and component in order to address the challenge that we're facing, that is a sarcasm. But this is a sine qua non condition, but it's not enough. Science should address those demands that a countries and a stakeholders are expecting from us. And in order to do that, it's necessary that we, we just came down or come down or come up from our uh, pedestal and communicate the right way that science. Go from the diagnostic into action, and provide the necessary transformative initiative and programs in order to face the challenge. And more importantly, that could be, we have already a framework in order to coordinate those actions that is in the case of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development and the achievement of the all sustainable development goals. In addition to that, we are facing, we are still face on the fourth or third wave of the coronavirus and the pandemic as the sargassum is not going away. And most of the countries are depending on the tourism, in particular in the uh, Western Tropical Atlantic. They are expecting from us very rapidly that we are coming up with some solutions they can, in such a way that they can move on from the COVID-19 pandemic into action when they are going to open their countries. So if they are going to open the country and still sargasso is on the beaches, so no way we can continue doing business as usual. So my, uh, the way how we are going to provide that science and those solutions is critical for the post-COVID-19 recovery. So please keep in mind that. 
And this will be your contribution to the changes that this society needs from, from now. And the work that we are doing is not just in, a, in isolation. That will come out as a final contribution to the transformation of our society. So think about the future. How bright will be that future if you do and coordinate and collaborate all of us at the all Atlantic wide experience. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of my feet. And back to you, Audrey. Thank you. That's that's a great conclusion and a great uh, transition for me. Um, as being the, the European coordinator for GeoBlue Planet, what you just described is definitely the mission of GeoBlue Planet. And I would encourage everyone to uh, contact Emily, who's our uh, Sargassum Working Group leader, um, or, or me, of course, if you want to, uh, you know, jump on the, the boat and, uh, and, uh, and work with us on, on trying to, you know, br bring everyone together stakeholders, scientists, so um, we can get the science to meet um, societal needs. Anyways, I would like to thank you all for uh, a beautiful, beautiful presentations, really interesting and, and a great panel. Thank you, César, for a very uh, timely work and uh, for a really interesting questions. I will be sending um, uh, by, by next week, sorry, um, an email to all attendees uh, with all the, you know, the reference and the questions and uh, all the, the interesting stuff that has been uh, said today in, in the chat and in, in the q and I'll also be updating all this information on the event website, which you must have, you know, gone through uh, to register for this event, uh, as well as on the Sargassum Hub. So everything that has been mentioned, you'll find um, the information on the on the events website in the Sargassum Hub. Thank you very much. And I will end this uh, event now. Thank you.